Hey guys and welcome back to subtopic 4.1 on energy. In this video we're going to cover electricity and fuel cells. This is the first science understanding. Although most electricity is generated using fuels to drive steam turbines, electrical energy can also be generated using photovoltaic cells, known as solar cells, and directly from oxidation of fuels using, using galvanic cells. State the advantages and disadvantages of direct electricity generation, that's from photovoltaic and fuel cells, compared to using steam turbines. We're going to look at steam turbines first. Most of Australia's electricity production comes from the movement of steam turbines, and this occurs from the burning of fossil fuels. Our prime example is looking at coal. So we look at processes that mine and process coal. We then feed the coal into a furnace or boiler, where we carry out the combustion of coal. The heat generated from that is going to be transferred into water that we feed into these series of pipes that uh, results in the production of, of high pressure steam which flows through the pipes and eventually into uh, the turbines here which are going to rotate and spin from the movement of that steam. The turbines are then connected to a generator which is designed to convert that rotational or mechanical energy into electrical energy. So that's our electricity produced there. The high pressure steam eventually can condense and cool down. We can use that water and feed it back into the system again, or we could feed it back into a body of water. In terms of electricity production from photovoltaic cells or solar cells, essentially how they work is that the solar cell is made up of a semiconductive material, which is typically silicon. And what happens is that when sunlight hits the photovoltaic cell, um, electrons are able to absorb this energy and they're able to freely move within certain layers of this solar cell and generate an electric current. So this movement of electrons is our current and it will then be able to be used by some type of device or a load. The current can be used directly it could be transmitted through power lines or it could even be stored in a battery. The advantage of this is that this electricity production doesn't generate any greenhouse gas emissions while it's operating. A disadvantage, however, is that greenhouse gas emissions are typically produced through the production of these photovoltaic cells. So the energy uh, requirements are typically obtained from the burning of fossil fuels. Before we talk about fuel cells, it's worthwhile if we do a bit of a summary on galvanic cells. This is revising concepts from Sage 1 Chemistry in subtopic 6.3 in electrochemistry. A galvanic cell we can define as an electrochemical cell that uses spontaneous redox reactions to generate an electric current. Another way of saying this is that it converts chemical potential energy into electrical energy. Galvanic cells can utilize simple metal displacement reactions. And to look at this, we're going to consider a galvanic cell. This represents a galvanic cell that consists of two what we call half cells. On the left side here, we have a zinc half cell. On the right, a copper half cell. We know that zinc is a more active or more reactive metal than copper. So when we connect these up, we find that zinc at the anode is going to undergo oxidation. So oxidation occurs at the surface, zinc then goes to produce zinc 2 plus ions, and that's represented by this half equation here. It loses two electrons. Those electrons can flow through an external circuit, so through some wires, and reach our copper half cell. So electrons will deposit onto here, and this allows for copper ions in solution in this half cell to undergo reduction and we get the formation of new copper atoms along the surface of this cathode. That can be represented by this half equation here where copper ions gain two electrons to form copper metal. We can combine these two half equations to write a net equation which represents what's occurring in redox and we would essentially end up with this here. This is what we call a metal displacement reaction where one metal which is more active is displacing another metal from a solution of its ions and it's doing that by giving it electrons effectively reducing it and allowing it to form into a solid metal. 
One more thing we need to consider is the presence of this salt bridge. So we say that the salt bridge helps complete the circuit and it also helps prevent the buildup of excessive charge in each of our half cells. In the zinc half cell we saw the production of zinc 2 plus ions which would increase the positive charge in this half cell. In the copper half cell we saw the essentially the loss of copper 2 plus ions to go to form copper metal so this half cell would have become increasingly negatively charged. To balance the buildup of charge we would have anions, in this case nitrate ions, moving into the zinc half cell which was becoming more positive and we would have sodium ions in the salt bridge traveling towards this copper half cell to help offset that increase in negative charge. A good way to summarize some of these processes in galvanic cells is the acronym SOPRANO. SOPRANO stands for cathode, which is the positive electrode. It's the site of reduction. A for anode, which is negatively charged, being the source of charge or source of electrons. And it is the site of oxidation. One more thing is we can talk about the movement of ions in our salt bridge we can conclude by saying that the anions in the salt bridge travel to the anode and both are negatively charged. Cations, which are positive, are going to move to the cathode, which is also positively charged. From that, now we can talk about fuel cells. Fuel cells are essentially specialized galvanic cells where the fuel and oxidant are in continuous supply. That's different to a conventional a galvanic cell or battery which store only limited quantities of reactants. And we can break this up into two types. We can call them primary cells. These ones can't be recharged so these are your one-time use batteries or they could be secondary cells which are your rechargeable batteries. What that means is that we can reverse their redox reactions by providing electrical energy. So we can charge up our batteries by connecting it to a, an external power source. This is a lead into the next science understanding. Fuel cells, including flow cells, are galvanic cells in which the electrode reactants are available in continuous supply. We need to be able to state the advantages and disadvantages of fuel cells compared with other galvanic cells, identify the anode and cathode and their charges, as well as the direction of ion and electron flow in a fuel cell, given, su given sufficient information, and write electrode half equations for a fuel cell given sufficient information. And we'll go through some examples of this. The first example is what we call a phosphoric acid fuel cell. Um, this uses what we call a proton exchange membrane, which is part of our electrolyte here. What that means is that it only allows the movement of protons or H plus through the electrolyte. It won't allow for the movement of electrons through they have to flow externally, so they'll flow through an external wire and help generate our electric current. In this fuel cell, our reactants are going to consist of hydrogen and oxygen, and we're going to start off on this uh, side here. So on this side, what we can see is hydrogen is going to be flowing in, and we get the oxidation of hydrogen gas. So hydrogen undergoes oxidation, it loses electrons. Those electrons have to flow externally through these wires, which then are connected to some type of load. They are then going to flow through the wires and down to this cathode here. We can also see that the hydrogen ions are migrating to the cathode, and what we're going to get is reduction of the oxygen gas that's coming through this side of our uh, fuel cell here. So we get reduction of oxygen gas and in doing so it results in the production of water and that water then can essentially leave our fuel cell and be removed. So to summarize that we can say that our fuel or our reductant is hydrogen gas, the oxidant is oxygen gas, at the anode we have hydrogen gas undergoing oxidation to form H plus and two electrons. Those two electrons again have to travel externally from the anode to the cathode. When they get to the cathode, we get the reduction of oxygen gas. 
um, combining with protons as well as electrons to eventually form water. With our anode half equation, we can see two electrons are lost. In the cathode half equation, four electrons are gained. So to write a net equation, we would need to double these reactions here to ensure that the number of electrons lost and gained are equal. So when we write our net equation, we cancel any common terms, which include our electrons, but they would also include our protons. We end up just with this simple net equation of two lots of H2 react with O2 to produce two lots of H2O. For another example, we're going to now consider an alkaline fuel cell. So the alkaline is to do with the electrolyte itself and what makes it up. Let's have a look at how this one works. So we have hydrogen flowing into this uh, left side at the anode here and we get oxidation in a similar manner. We can see at this point that the hydrogen gas interacts with hydroxide ions and in doing so this is going to produce water and we get the loss of electrons which then have to flow externally um, from the anode to the cathode. The water can be removed at this stage but if we have a look over to this right side we still get the reduction of oxygen gas but uh, on this side what we see is the gain of electrons but the creation of more of this hydroxide. So let's just go back again. We can see oxygen gas here reacting with some of the water and it resulting in the formation of um, hydroxide ions. So we can think that essentially replenishes some of the hydroxide that reacted at the anode to produce water. If we summarize these half equations, again we can see that the fuel or reductant is H2, oxygen is O2, at the anode, in an alkaline fuel cell, hydrogen reacts with two lots of hydroxide to produce two lots of water and two electrons. At the cathode, we have oxygen reacting with water, gaining four electrons and forming four hydroxides. We can see in this case that the electrons lost and gain aren't equal, so we'd effectively need to double this half equation. And when we write the net equation, we should find that we get exactly the same net equation as the previous example. What we can do is compare our conventional galvanic cells um, versus our fuel cells in a range of categories and these are going to outline some of the advantages that fuel cells have over our conventional galvanic cells. So in terms of reactant availability, uh, for galvanic cells this is based on the quantities stored whereas with the fuel cells we know that they can continuously be supplied. In regards to lifespan, galvanic cells usually have a limited lifespan, including those rechargeable galvanic cells, whereas fuel cells are virtually unlimited. In terms of energy output, we know that with galvanic cells this decreases as the cell runs down, whereas with the fuel cell it's relatively constant because it's never discharging. And finally, in regards to waste, there are environmental concerns with the disposal of batteries or portable galvanic cells and even some non-portable forms like car batteries. Uh, whereas with fuel cells, the waste or byproducts are often non-threatening. So in the previous examples, we could see that only water was a byproduct and we know that's not going to be threatening. What we can also do is look at the overall advantages and disadvantages of fuel cells. So firstly, in terms of advantages, they usually have a quiet operation. They are typically efficient at converting chemical potential energy into electrical energy. The waste or byproducts are less harmful, so they can consist of water, and depending on what type of fuel, it can be carbon dioxide as well. We don't end up with the emission of nitrogen and sulfur oxides, which can contribute to photochemical smog and acid rain and they require very minimal maintenance. The disadvantages, however, is that the fuels like hydrogen may be obtained through fossil fuels. So we know that we can convert methane gas into hydrogen gas through certain processes. The impurities in fuel or oxygen can contaminate the electrodes, and so we will need to look at repairing or replacing them. The fuel sources often need to be of high purity and 
The oxidants which we require are usually quite expensive. In terms of infrastructure, it's currently quite limited, so it is still quite expensive. And in terms of the electrodes, they typically use rare metals like platinum, and these can be extremely expensive, especially for using them as catalysts. For our last science understanding, flow cells have the advantage over other fuel cells of being rechargeable. So we're just going to look at what these so-called flow cells are. Flow cells we can define as a rechargeable fuel cell. Flow cells are typically different because the reactants themselves are dissolved in the electrolytes and these electrolytes are separated by an ion selective membrane. So that ion selective membrane would be here between the two electrodes. We have two different uh, electrolytes. One's called the analyte and the other's called the catholyte. The analyte is the electrolyte at the anode and the catholyte is the cathode electrolyte. These analytes and catholytes are pumped through half cells from external tanks. We store these analyte and catholytes separately to the actual flow cell. They are pumped through, which may require some energy to do so, and this flow through the half cells and at the surface of these electrodes is what's going to allow for the generation of an electric current. As mentioned before, these are rechargeable fuel cells. So in order to recharge these, we essentially need to reverse the reactions. And one thing that can help that is by changing the direction that these uh, analytes and catholytes essentially get pumped through. So with an input of energy, we can allow for the movement in the reverse direction and essentially allow the reverse reactions to take place. And so what this means is that you can allow this flow cell to run virtually um, forever, provided you have a place to store your electrolytes. Um, these can actually be stored underground, so that's another benefit. And you also have a way of being able to reverse these redox reactions and get the electrolytes to flow in the opposite direction. To summarize this, the advantages that flow cells have over fuel cells is that they virtually have an unlimited lifespan. And as mentioned before, the electrolytes can be stored externally to the cell. They can be stored underground in storage tanks. They are suitable for large stationary applications. So if we want to look at large scale electricity production, it's possible with flow cells, but not necessarily fuel cells. Flow cells are rechargeable and they can be recharged quickly just by pumping the electrolytes in the opposite direction. There are no emissions of pollutants or byproducts during their operation, so everything is essentially contained within the flow cell. And the energy capacity of these flow cells is limited to the size of the storage tanks. So there are definitely some key advantages of flow cells over fuel cells, and they are a fairly recent development. So it will be interesting to see where flow cells may actually lead us in the future. That concludes this series of videos on 4.1 Energy. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.